Good afternoon. Just wanted to share a couple things today. I don't always get a lot of opportunity to do these um, video teachings um, and even write some of the stuff like I do in the website. I really wish I had more time, but um, with my business and family and uh, my precious little seven-year-old son, Joshua Caleb, who has autism, um, it, uh, I love spending time with him. And he wants to spend a lot of time with me. And he does require some extra attention. And um, I love that kid. I, I really do. God blessed me and my wife um, with little Joshua a little over seven years ago. And it has been an adventure. It has really been eye-opening as well in um, how God is showing me his relationship to me through my relationship to my son. And just the the agape love I have for my for my son and the and the um, the forgiveness the patience those things that, that need to be operating um, between me and my son and my wife in this and we're learning great things and God is faithful and um, I pray always just to have ears to hear how he's speaking to me and to any of us through family situations work situations and things like that but I just want to talk a little bit today about the goal. What, what is our goal as a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, at, at, as a Christian? What is the goal? Excuse my handwriting, it's not the greatest. The goal. What is the goal? Um, I'm guessing if I ask this question, and many of you are here, I might hear the word um, heaven. I might hear the word heaven as being the goal. From others, the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. I might put paradise after this heaven also. Depending on who you speak to, maybe perhaps with denomination. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out, and I think we'll see this in the scripture, these are not synonymous. The kingdom of God and heaven are not the same thing. Many that I speak to, they seem to put them in the same category, and we speak about eternity um, in the kingdom of God, and they'll, they'll think of heaven. I think we'll see from the scripture, from both New and Old Testament, that the kingdom of God, for one thing, is coming to the earth. It is... In Revelation chapters 21 and 22, it speaks of, the, of New Jerusalem coming down to the earth. And God is going to dwell with man, and they will be his people, and he will be their God. And if you look in the Old Testament and in the prophets, and they speak about the lion, you know, lying down with the lamb, and the kid playing by the hole of the viper, that's all physical. That's not a spiritual. Heaven is spiritual. We don't go to heaven after our death, and we suddenly have physical bodies. In the heavenly realm, which is not really up there or over there someplace else, it is actually around us. We can't see it. It's another dimension, another realm, so to speak. And those who are there, God, the angels, many other beings are spiritual. They're, they're spirits. They are not physical. Jesus is the only one at this point in time who is a physical and spiritual being being converged. When he came forth, uh, we just celebrated uh, Resurrection Sunday recently, when, when Jesus came out of the tomb, he was a new creation. He was something that had never been before. He was now a being fully human and fully divine, spiritual, made in the image of Almighty God. Um, he is the expression of God in bodily form. But <clears throat> I want to look at something else today as, as being our goal. Yes, I do believe, my personal belief, and I look forward to the kingdom of God, the physical manifestation of the kingdom, um, God dwelling with man, coming to the earth. I, I long for that daily, and righteousness, peace, and joy reigning upon the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. But Philippians chapter 3 is... There's a passage in here where Paul speaks about his goal. And I like to, when, I have given, when I'm given opportunity to present this passage to individuals who 
realize that there's something more. There's something beyond the traditional, it's a modern tradition, it doesn't date back to the scripture, the, um, the belief that we're, we're saved, we're forgiven, um, and we're going to go to heaven when we die. There are those, I believe, watching us right now, who th this, they know that there's something more than just that. That is not the end. Um, and I've looked at a bunch of the stuff on the website. First, First Corinthians chapter 10 um, speaks, Paul's writing, and it speaks clearly about our being saved and then the journey and then the destination. Um, the salvation is not the beginning. Is, I mean, it's not the end. It's the very beginning. It's the very first step. And many that were saved... And they were saved. In fact, they were baptized and they even partook of Christ. If you read in 1 Corinthians 10, um, Israel in the Exodus and through the wilderness. But most of them, in fact, the vast majority of them did not enter into the promised land. And even then, the promised land is not, is not a picture of heaven. It's actually more a picture of the kingdom of God. But that's something we'll look at in depth a little bit later, um, another time perhaps. But Paul, speaking in Philippians chapter 3, and we know, you know, Paul was raised a Jew. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he calls himself, of the tribe of Benjamin. Um, he did everything according to the law. He kept the law perfectly. He did all those things according to the law of Moses and some of the other stuff that they had added to it. But we know that that can't save. Paul kept all the law, as did many others. There's many others in the scripture who kept the law. Um, John the Baptist's parents, um, there's some other ones that mentioned that, that, that they kept the law. But his heart was, I'm not going to say it wasn't, uh, well, he had a heart for God because Paul thought that he was serving God. Even in his persecution of the church, Paul thought that he was serving the living God. And he looked at these Christians as being blasphemous and heretics, and that's why he was persecuting them until the Lord Jesus revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus and changed. He gave them the opportunity to change right there, and, and he did. And praise God, that's why we have about half the New Testament to which he had written. So Paul thought that he was serving God in all this, but his heart was not in the right place. He knew, you could say, and I've heard it said by, by many others, he knew about God, but he didn't really know God. Because if he had known God, if the Pharisees had known God and had known his word, they would have recognized Jesus when he came. And Paul, I mean, uh, uh, Jesus talks to Nicodemus about this when he came to him in John chapter 3. And he said, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Um, some recognized him, but he did not come as they expected I'm currently doing a, a writing on that right now on the, on, on the second coming. And Jesus did not appear on the scene as they thought he was going to as, as a warrior king at that time. Um, that was not in the plan and purpose of God. But here's Paul's goal. Paul's goal. First he counts in, in uh, uh, 3.7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. And it's interesting. It's, it's lost for Christ. Because Jesus Christ had called. He's called us for a purpose. And if we're not entering into that purpose, and we're not walking that path, yes, it's a loss for us, but it's also a loss for Christ. There's a certain number. There are a certain amount of thrones predestined. That must be filled. There's a there's a um, a number of Gentiles that must come in um, before all Israel can be saved. There is a number, and the Lord God, in His sovereignty, has has positions available that are going to be filled. And when we don't walk in that, and l like uh, like in Esther, He said if if the, He wanted Israel to be saved or the Jews to be saved through her, He said if if not. They're still going to get saved, but then she would have missed out. God would have would have he would have had to turn to someone else, and he'll do the same thing for us. If God has called us to rule with Him, to become one with Jesus Christ, one with God the Father, and minister life to creation, if He has called us to that and predestined us to that, it's not a lock. 
we have to enter into it. We have to receive it. We have to surrender ourselves as a living sacrifice. It will cost us everything, friends. If that is God's call upon our life, it cost Jesus everything. And he went to the cross. He was obedient to death, even death on the cross. And we must be obedient, obedient to the death that he has designed for us as well. If we're going to enter into that inheritance and become one with him and sit upon that throne. And if not, if we fail in that by our own choices, he will find another. So Paul, he, all that that he had gained in, in, um, in Judaism, he had counted it was a loss for Christ because he was not where he was supposed to be. But then he turned to that. He accepted that. When Ananias came and laid his hands on him and healed his blindness um, from the light that shone on the road to Damascus, he was immediately baptized. And then he turned his life over to Jesus Christ. And we see the things that, that he went through, and they were not fun. Verse 8, Yet indeed I also count things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So yes, he lost everything. That he might gain Christ. That was what he realized. Jesus Christ was the most important thing. Everything else was secondary. And be found in him, verse 9, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, again the law of Moses, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead or out from among the dead. Other translations, this appears to be the first resurrection that Paul is talking about. We know from other places in the scripture, even Jesus is teaching, that every single person is going to be raised at some point. They're going to be resurrected. The resurrection doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to end up in the kingdom because there's a resurrection to life, which Jesus is. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But then there's also a resurrection to either damnation or condemnation or judgment, depending on the translation. And those do not enter into life. They do not enter into the kingdom. And many are cast either into outer darkness to get a lake of fire. I don't want to go to either one of those places. Um, but Paul's goal was to know Christ. Not just to go to a place or to be in another realm, but to know Christ and fellowship with his sufferings and being conformed like him in his death. And that's what our baptism is supposed to represent. From Romans 6, we reread that. He says, don't you know as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? And if we've been baptized like him in his death, then we shall be raised like him to newness of life. One precedes the other. The death has to precede the life. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would understand what our baptism truly represents. And we, we have a symbol of, of going in the water and coming up, and Jesus did the same thing to fulfill all righteousness. And But it, our life itself, in a sense, and I'm going to do a study on this another time from Ezekiel and to all other places' background, our entire life is a baptism because we've gone down and we're dying and we're being flushed and cleansed of those things which will not inherit the kingdom. And then we're being fed to new life of Christ. So then we, when we're raised and when we come out of that water, the spirit, the substance of Christ, we are a new creation. Actually a new creation. We say the term now, but I cannot say that I'm fully a new creation right now because of, just because I've accepted Christ. Because if I look in the mirror and I'm still doing some of the same things that the old man, it, the old me would do, and rises up sometimes, and I am not fully a new creation. And I, I have good conversations with some good brothers on this about the the born again. In a sense, we're born again, but I look at it as a as a um, uh, it's a gestation period. We are not fully born again. I believe my stance is we're not fully born again until, like Jesus Christ, 
we are physical and spiritual converged. We come out and we are raised with Christ to new life. In that day that he comes in First Thessalonians chapter 4, I know many preach that as, a, as the saints are going, but it's not. Jesus is coming and he's bringing the saints out of the grave. He's bringing their spirits to which have been seated at the right hand of Christ in heaven to be united with their body. And they're going to be clothed with that body that was formed in the heavens. And now they're going to appear with him as he is because we've purified ourselves. If we've purified ourselves. So Paul's goal was to become one with Christ. And he speaks of the inheritance many times in, 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 his, um, in his epistles and letters. And uh, it didn't happen all at once. I think we have some traditions, man-made traditions that have arisen that once we have accepted Christ, that all the promises are ours. And, and there's nothing that can change that because of God's grace and His sovereign will, sovereign will. But Paul never taught that. Jesus didn't teach The scripture doesn't teach that. Paul says, and this is after he had been walking with the Lord, he had spent, I think it was 14 years alone with the Lord in the desert, receiving from him things that he can't even, he said he can't even tell us right now. He wasn't even, even able to write down. <coughs> Excuse me. So Philippians 3 verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Are we striving to lay hold of what Christ has laid hold of us for. It's not all the same thing. The end is to be one with him. But our gifts and ministries along the way and that route that we must walk, that path that we must take, is not the same for all of us. We know from um, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, and Romans 12, there are lists of, of gifts that God gives, the Spirit gives, in accordance to the faith that God has given us, that we walk in, so that we fulfill our place in the body of Christ. And it's not all the same. We're not all called to be evangelists. We're not all called to be prophets. We're not all called to be teachers. We're not all called to be um, uh, to operate in the gifts of helps, in mercy, in giving. These are all different gifts, and God has laid hold through Jesus Christ, of each one differently. The gifts differ. There's one Spirit, one Lord, one baptism, but the gifts differ. But they have the same purpose, to bring us into union with Christ. So let me write that down. So is it heaven or paradise? Is it the kingdom of God? Or is the goal to become one with Christ? And honestly, I want this to be my goal. I want that to be my goal. Whether it was in the kingdom of God on earth, or whether we did go up to heaven. The point is, is to be united, to be one with Christ. A new, transfer, a, a new transformed individual. Someone who is same heart, soul and mind is Christ. I know it says in Corinthians, it talks about we have eyes not seen, ears not heard, nor entered into the mind the things that God has in store for those who love him. But then the next verse, which we, we don't read very often, it says, but we have the mind of Christ. He's revealing himself, friends. As we move closer toward the end, as the wheat is coming to maturity along with the tares. And we see that in the world right now. The tares, are, they're coming to maturity. The evil is just insane out there right now. And it's getting worse. But, but the wheat is growing as well. We need to recognize that we have been called to be part of the wheat. So if we are, if we have, are partaking of our daily bread, the substance of Christ, then we can have his mind. If we tune in, if we focus, fix our eyes on Jesus Christ as we run our race, he will reveal things to us. 
And I pray I'm on the right track. And if anyone's watching this and you think I'm off, write to me, tell me on the YouTube or the website or whatever. But I believe this is what the Lord is revealing to me. I see it all over the scripture, New Testament and Old alike, that God is bringing us into union with himself to be ministers of his agape love, mercy and grace and healing for the nations, for the multitudes of people who are not called in this life, but will be welcomed in in that day of resurrection, the second resurrection, the sheep and goat nations. I did a video on that a while ago. And that is it, it, that seems so foreign to many churches today. But aside from all the preaching about salvation and being forgiven and going to heaven, is this other message that runs consistently from Genesis to Revelation, that God is raising up a Messiah, head and body, who is going to bring life, the life of God, to creation and drive out the sin, the corruption, the other things that are foreign to God. They're going to be driven out. We see that in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 13, that when he comes, he's going to remove from his kingdom all things that offend and those who commit iniquity. So those who commit iniquity are going to be driven out. Now whether you call yourself a Christian or not, if we're full of iniquity, we will be driven out from God's kingdom. We will not be in New Jerusalem. Whether, whether we're in outer darkness or whether we're just outside the gates of New Jerusalem, as it says in Revelation uh, 22 toward the end there, Another verse that doesn't fit our modern doctrine. We'll look at that another time as well. I'm going to run out of time. My kid's actually going to be coming home from school pretty soon. But I, I wanted to take the few minutes that I had here to look at Paul's goal. I, I want this to be my goal. I, I really do. I don't think I have the same passion yet as Paul did. But it's growing within me. To know Jesus Christ. The power of his resurrection. To enter into his sufferings. I'm not going to die on the cross like he did, but I have to submit myself as dead before him. I have to put the death of deed to the flesh. I have to be raised to new life. I have to have the heart that he has. He has a heart for the downtrodden, for the children that are suffering, that are, that are born of fetuses. Jesus has a heart for that. And part of his suffering is he wants to end that now. But he's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Honestly, friends, he's waiting for the church, for the elect, for those he has called to become one with him, to repent, to turn from our wicked ways, to humble ourselves and seek his face. And then he can heal the land. He can bring life to those through us. He can bring life. Not now. We don't rise up now. We prepare ourselves now. Prepare the way of the Lord. Our job is to be preparing ourselves today so that when Jesus Christ is revealed at his second coming, we are raised with him. We are able to drive out sin from the earth. And we're able to minister life to creation. I said a little bit here this morning or this afternoon. And uh, if anything has touched your heart, and you have any questions, please just respond. I, I, I love discussing the things of God's kingdom. And I, I pray for more opportunity to be able to do this. Um, peace on your homes. Peace be with you. Blessings on your family. And may you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches today. Amen.